The area I'm walking to today um, was titled by the Pacific War historian William Barsh, A Crucial Battle Ignored. It is the site of the uh, diversionary attack um, by the Kuma Battalion in September 1942, um, <clears throat> just in support of Bloody Ridge. This engagement is um, generally unknown. There's been a, a good book and an award-winning article um, written about it. But other than that, I haven't really seen it. I mentioned in mainly only footing side notes, you know, their accounts. But it's a very crucial battle, and um, hopefully in this episode, you'll see why. All right, I'll set the stage. I'm actually on the battlefield itself. Uh, I'll show you by using this map. So I think most um, viewers are familiar with the Battle of Bloody Ridge, which is a very important battle, and I've already done some episodes on that. But not too many people are familiar as I said in my introduction, the two diversionary attacks that uh, were supposed to uh, support simultaneously the, uh, the assault by the Kawaguchi uh, Brigade from the south. So the area I'm focusing on today is the scene of one of those diversionary attacks. That's the attack here on the night of the 13th and 14th of September 1942. And they landed at Taivu Point, which is off the map here. And they were going to be involved in the, uh, the attack on Bloody Ridge. They were going to be using a diversionary uh, assault. So there's about 800 of them. Um, roughly 300 was taken away, so it left 500. So the plan was the Kawaguchi, the main assault force, was going to come down and attack from the south on Bloody Ridge. At the same time, the 500 um, remnants of the Kuma Battalion or Bear Battalion is doing a diversionary attack on this area here. Now this area was the site of the Overland Trail, which was a main uh, pre-war road, and I have another map I'll show in a second, that linked directly to Airfield uh, Fighter 1 and Henderson here. So this site here will be the focus. When I mention the Overland Trail, you'll see in this, I think, 1944 map, because Fighter Airfield 1 is quite substantial here. But you'll notice this area here. So it was a road. It came through, crossed the, the Tenere River, and went back down and hooked up with a government track. So that was a pre-existing road. So the Japanese um, focused their attack here, which was a lot of their attacks on Guadalcanal. There was at a, at a uh, nice, easy avenue of approach. So here's a, um, a modern Google map. Hopefully the glare isn't too bad. Let's see if you can see it. Now you'll pick up the trail there. So it's still in existence today, and they've run a, um, a telegraph um, wires, as they call it, or the power lines, straight down it. As you can see, the trail nowadays, so here's the Overland Trail. And this is the focal point. And that's what it looks like today. So I'm filming this right from the actual trail itself. I'm sitting on top of it. So you can see the, the modern power lines, but that is the opening of the Overland Trail. So that's looking um, back west toward Fighter Airfield 1. I'll pan around for you. This was all the kunai grass and cut down uh, during the war. So here I'm at the, um, the head the opening of the um, Overland Trail. So the cutback um, over the years, the actual marine fault cells are probably about 50 yards um, in the cleared field or the paddock here. Um, during the time of the battle, they were actually in a jungle line. This position was held by Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marine. So Marines knowing this was the um, focal point of the attack, just like they did in most of their trail junctions, they covered it heavily with machine guns. So, Kilo Company was stretched out about 750 yards. So I'm in the, um, the trail now. So to my right, that probably went down another three or 400 yards. And then their um, right was refused, as they called it, which is basically means there was no one there. So there was a, a few hundred yards gap between the end of the line there and Bloody Ridge, which is in that direction. So if the Japanese had done the reconnaissance, they probably could have went around. But saying that, this thick jungle, the Japanese knew that if they um, put 500 men in a thick jungle, they might as well just not even attack because they'd been 
um, so confused and lost their um, unit cohesion. So they knew the fastest way to, to push them through was to go on a trail on a mass bonsai charge. So the Kuma Battalion uh, Commander Major Mizuno, hopefully I get this right. And his men, they were supposed to attack on the 12th, but they were delayed and the, the attack on Blade Ridge occurred on the 12th. Well, the Marines knew the, the Japanese were, were coming. So they took a six-man patrol or combat outpost and the river's about 500 yards in that way, that direction. So they stuck them about 15 yards on, on this side of the river. The Japanese had done a, a reconnaissance. They, they'd spotted one of the um, 30 cal machine guns that had marines had 30 cal on that side a 30 cal on that side and on the end they had the m1917 um 30 caliber heavy machine guns on both flanks but they'd spotted it so they knew roughly where the marine positions were this combat outpost as soon as the japanese crossed the river the combat outpost which of or out of um six of them five of them had um thompson submachine guns opened up on the Japanese. Well, the Japanese commander, instead of uh, pushing forward to achieve surprise, he stopped and they basically chased the Marines and threw hand grenades in the river and, and, and spent their time there. So about 150 um, yards from the uh, Marine lines, and walking across basically and the kill zone. So the Marines had the barbed wire about 50 yards out. So this is the field the Japanese attacked across. Basically, follow the power line. That's the um, trail. So to attack, the main focus point was straight in front of me here. So they'd, instead of attacking in mass, attack one company at a time. And for some reason, the Japanese commander put his headquarter group as a leading unit. Well, the Marines heard them um, heard the combat outposts open up, and they were waiting for them. And then they heard um, the wire being snipped, and the machine guns. See if we can see. I wish all this was cut down. Like I said, probably about 150 yards that way. Opened up on them. And they fired each machine gun on both sides, fired about a thousand rounds. Then it was cease fire. But what they had actually done, um, they'd killed the battalion command, Japanese battalion commander. So I think he was leading from the front and he took a round right in the head and killed him instantly. Uh, one of the other Japanese um, lieutenants ran and the other one was pinned down. So things went silent for a while. The, the, the Marines had the 81 millimeters and the 60 millimeter mortars and also the 75 millimeter pack housers that started landing in this field all in front of me here and around me. Well, throughout the evening, Japanese made several um, attacks when each company would come up, basically against the Marine line in that area from there. I know you're just looking at uh, vegetation, you really can't see much. To there some of it was hand to hand so by the time morning time came the japanese um assaults was completed and it was only a, a bit of sporadic sniper fire they call it so there had been reports that some of the japanese were hiding in the kunai grass so the marines sent six um stewart tanks from um, henderson area and they came up this trail here that's the direction of henderson straight down this track and spread it out across the field. See if we can send a distance. You can see some of the coconut. I don't know if you can see it. Palm trees in the far distance. That's the, the boundary of the field. So they went about that far and right behind that, not too far, is the actual Tenderu River. So they went across. They didn't see any Japanese and they came back. And then a bit later, some of the patrol actually came in. The combat outpost guys came in and reported some. Japanese machine gun in a hut um, bordering the river. So the tanks went out again and according to the accounts the Marine infantry guys was telling them you know don't go the same route and the, the tanks went the same route. The Japanese had four 37 millimeters anti-tank guns on this side of the river. They waited till the Marines got very close and then they opened up. They took out two Marine tanks with anti-tank gun fire. One of the Marine tanks took out the Japanese machine gun in the hut, but then overshot the hut and flipped into the river, drowning the crew. 
and the rest of the tanks uh, Tank pulled back. River. All right, this is the area from the the one Marine Stewart tank overshot, hit a log, and flipped upside down in the uh, river. So it's probably in, in that area, somewhere in the uh, area in front of me there. Unfortunately, the crew drowned. They had the, uh, the tank's been was pulled out days later. I read that, so it's not still there. I managed to locate one of the um, foxholes, and later was um, a coconut log bunker when the Marines had time after the September battle to uh, reinforce positions and expand on their defensive works. You'll probably see in some of my um, uh, episodes of Coffin Corner. This line ties in with the Coffin Corner, so the U.S. Army um, and the Marines occupied this for, for literally months, um, this line. So the, the photos I'll show you um, on this video is actually um, from that time period. You'll see the coconut log bunkers. But during the actual um, fighting here, just like on Bloody Ridge, um, <clears throat> they were just opened a uh, fox hose. Might have had a, a poncho over the top for sun protection or rain protection. So this, I'm in a hole. Once again, you probably can't see. I'll get down. It would have been a lot clearer then, but it's looking out of a marine position. So the Overland Trail is right there. So this is one of the, um, from Kilo Company. I forget which uh, platoon. Abadie's platoon. Um, the one that the, um, his son wrote a, a book later called The Overland Trail about his father, Ebony. Now I'm at the eastern end of the field. Uh, once again, you can see the power lines, reference point, and we'll cross a, if you notice, concrete slab. Anywhere you see concrete slabs here, especially good quality of the Stanley World War II. This area, after the land campaign, uh, became the um, eighth mobile surgical hospital for the U.S. Navy. In fact, it was the largest um, established rear area um, hospital on Guadalcanal, as you know, from 44 and 45 and 40, late 43. This is a large logistical and rear area base, so there's a lot of uh, hospitals here. This is the largest, the grounds are the largest one. I mean, now it's a boarding school, which is, was common after the war. So, this is a good view of the actual field. So, that's the entrance to the um, Overland Trail. <clears throat> Marines also referred it is, uh, to it as the Amphibious uh, Tractor Trail. Because I'll show you a photo. Um, it's a fairly famous photo. It's this two amphibious tractors with a um, wooden bridge across it used to ford Alligator Creek. So that's another reason the Japanese focused here. So now I've crossed the, um, the road and I'm actually walking on the, the track of the original overland track uh, when it goes down to the river. You won't be able to tell it but it's very hard packed underneath me. So this is to be the route that the tanks drove down and they encountered the uh, Japanese anti-tank guns. So somewhere in this area here was the hut with the machine gun that took on the, um, the tank took out. They drew the attention of the, um, the tanks which drew the attention of the 37 millimeters. Now we're coming up to the Ford. <clears throat> now we've had a lot of rain recently, but normally it's crystal clear and you can see the bottom. And um, you can see the other side. So that's the extension of the Overland Trail. So this will be the, the spot where the Japanese crossed the river on the night of the, uh, September the 13th. And about 15 yards from the bank near the crossing, so somewhere in there, was the Marine outpost. Lieutenant Terzi, unfortunately, was later killed at Cape Gloucester, and he under Silver Star for this action, but himself and five other Marines uh, triggered the uh, Japanese, which probably actually um, really assisted Marines when they, once they got to the trailhead. There's about 550 men in the Kuma Battalion. Estimated casualties was about 300 killed in action. Not as bad as the uh, first echelon, but uh, very bad. Marine casualties very light.